On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, you'll be listening to me. That's right, you're listening to me. And it's about time and timers. We'll be talking about time and timers on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hi there, Doug O'Brien here. It's so nice to have you here and join me. It's a rainy day here in upstate New York and uh, cold, rainy. I'm glad to be indoors talking to you. So thank you for joining me. Now, of course, I don't know where you are or when you're listening to this, and that's kind of pertinent, kind of uh, uh, appropriate, because this is a podcast about time. It's about time. It's it's about time we did a podcast about time. And uh, really, it's also about timers. We'll get more to that later. But uh, before we get any any further in, into this podcast, I wanted to introduce you to a friend of mine. It, it, he, he sounds or it sounds like this. There it goes. Here we go. Ah, it's a timer. It's a timer. Timing time. It's a countdown timer. It's a kitchen timer, to be precise. And it uh, is really handy when you're cooking eggs or pasta or pies or, well, you get the idea. But time is such an interesting concept, isn't it? I mean, it's really one of my favorite inventions of mankind is is time. And it, it is, by the way, an invention. It is doesn't actually exist except for... Uh, the construct we've created. Um, basically, time is a measurement of change, isn't it? And we, inhabitants of this uh, spaceship Earth, if you will, um, because it rotates on its axis once every, well, what we call 24 hours, once a day, gets back to the same sort of starting point it started from. We, we measure that uh, change. We measure that rotation. We call it a day. Why? Why do we call it a day? And think about it. If the world was smaller or if it was larger or if it was spinning faster, then that day would be different, wouldn't it? Or if you got on a, not spaceship Earth, but a spaceship and left the Earth, went out of its rotational conflux, whatever the word is, if you got up there into space, there would be no time like that, you know, because you would be daytime constantly. You'd be in the sun eternally until, of course, you got on the, in the shadow side if you were in rotation like that, but you could be considerably in the same light forever, right? Or until you got farther and farther and farther away and the light didn't reach you so much anymore. You know what I'm talking about, however, time would be a very, very different experience up there. And even a few hundred years ago, maybe a thousand years ago, it was very, very different. The Romans invented uh, the hours, I think it was them. I don't know for a fact that it was them, but I know that they um, invented a form of time with the 12 hours in a day, and they measured it with a sundial. Only problem with that, of course, is you can readily jump to the idea and understanding is that uh, those hours change, don't they? From 12 to 12 or from six to six, however it's measured in the sundial. Because why? Summertime, it's longer hours. Wintertime, it's shorter hours. It changes every day. There's a difference every day. So those hours are going to be different every day. Somewhere along the line, somebody said, well, we got to get a little bit more specific with this. And they, they codified it. They invented a measurement of time. They said, okay, we'll divide a period of one rotation of the earth into 24 hours. And I'm sure there's historical reason for that. And, you know, we can measure 24 hours or two sets of 12 
12 a.m., 12 p.m. kind of thing, right? And then so that's a, if it, with that measurement, then it's, well, the familiar 60 minutes that you're familiar with. And then they divided those minutes up into seconds and seconds into various parts. And it's all invented. It's all invented. If you were out in space, then you could come up with a different way of doing that. I think that's really kind of interesting. And did you know that time zones was also a very recent uh, invention? And I'll tell you why. In just a moment, I will tell you why. It's, but when you stop and think about it, um, for a long time, noon was measured when the sun was directly over your head. That was noon. That was generally accepted, commonly accepted, okay, noon. And from this point forward, it's afternoon. And prior to this moment, it was before noon, morning. But for a long time, it was just a convenience. And if you were in, like, say, New York City, or if you were in Syracuse, or if you're in Rochester or Buffalo, that noontime would be different. Even though it's all right now all the same Eastern Standard Time, each of those cities would have a different experience of when it's directly overhead for them because they're separated by a few hundred miles. All the way, I think, to Cleveland, it's, you know, the same time zone. That's not a problem, unless it is. Uh, you know, back a back hundred or more, 50 years ago, 150 years ago or so, it wasn't a problem. So if you went into the bank and the bank class said it was 12 afternoon and you went into the hotel and it said it was 20 past noon, if it said it went into the post office and it was said five minutes before noon, it didn't really matter. You just were there then. You were there at the time that you were there, right? It's okay, no big deal. When did it become a big deal? Railroads. Railroads made it a big deal that you had to be on time. You had to be on railroad time. And the railroads had to be very consistent with that as well. Watch manufacturers became very precise and highly paid to do it precisely because why? There were railroad tracks that had trains going in opposite directions on the same track. So they would sometimes collide with each other with great damage and death for these trains being on the same track going in the opposite directions at the same time. The time-space continuum doesn't allow for that, right? So they would smash up and people would die and be great loss of property. Um, so they really wanted to get it right. So they get the trains onto the adjacent tracks or the, you know, not, you know, whatever. So it became very, very important that we created a standardized time. And seaboards and Pacific time and Eastern time, all those different things that they had was again for railroads. It was for railroads. It was in fact invented by a just nameless railroad employee that's been forgotten in time, forgotten in history. Just guy, some guy said, hey, you know what we should do? We should draw these lines. And you just drew these arbitrary lines on this, on this big map they had. And they said, we'll call this the Eastern time and this is the Western time and this is whatever time, Central time. You know, he just made it up. And it's been the thing that we've done ever since. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. So time is one of those fascinating things that we <laughs> spend much too much time worrying about in a way, don't you think? Because it's always now when you really stop and think about it, there is no past. That's a memory. There's no future. That's an imaginatory, imaginational, imagine, what am I trying to say? It's, a, it's an imaginary construct, right? It's now. It's always now. And I'm thinking back to the past. Even if I do the deep trance thing and I go like, I'm back in the past. No, I'm not really. I'm just in my mind. I'm pretending to be feeling like I am, right? It's always happening now, right now. And so it's a kind of useful thing to recognize that if you can just get off that uh, roller coaster, you know, get off that little, you know, gerbil wheel of time and uh, be here now, it's a wonderful thing. And as entrepreneurs, as coaches, as humans who have to, you know, get things done in this construct of time that we're world and business that we have. You know, you want to be on time for meetings, don't you? 
you know, it's rude to be late for a meeting. If you're particularly, you know, professional, you should be there when you say you're going to be there, you know, get on Zoom when you say you're going to get on Zoom. This is an important thing. It's important to get a job done on time. It's important to, you know, meet your deadlines. I remember once a long time ago when I was a music student, I was I had the privilege of, of, of attending a composer's conference. I was a composer. I was working towards a, a degree in composition at the university I was attending, um, both piano and composition. And so I went to this composer's conference where they had these amazing people. It was just spectacular. And I, Probably the most amazing person that I met there at that conference was Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland, if you don't know, is an American composer who wrote things like Appalachian Spring and um, Fanfare for a Common Man, a bunch of really great things, Rodeo. And he was giving a lecture and I was sitting in the front row of this uh, classroom, basically, at the University of Buffalo. And he was being very casual and chummy. He sort of come, came around and sat on the front, you know, front of the teacher's desk at the front of the classroom. And so I was like basically knee to knee with Aaron Copeland. It was very thrilling. And um, charming man gave a nice talk. And then he asked if there were any questions. And I wanted to ask him a question just because I wanted to ask him a question. It was Aaron Copeland. I wanted to have some kind of interaction with Aaron Copeland. So someday I could tell this story, <laughs> I guess. That's why I wanted to do it. So anyway, I, I raised my hand and I said, um, Mr. Copeland, he said, yes, young man in the front row. What's your question? You didn't talk like that, but I, I said, what, what was your inspiration for Appalachian Spring? And I will admit to you now publicly that it was one of the only compositions of Aaron Copeland's I knew at the time. Um, so I said, what was your inspiration for Appalachian Spring? And, and I was expecting, just so you know, I was expecting a very romantic answer because, you know, textbooks, histories of classical music, they've got all these stories about, you know, like when Beethoven wrote the pastoral symphony, symphony number no. six, it was, you know, he was walking through the forest and he heard these birds twittering and said, oh, let me capture that in music. And then the, the storm came up and whoosh, you could hear that in the music. A you know, very romantic notion. So I, I expected an answer like that from Ap from Aaron Copeland. I expected him to say, "Well, I was walking through Appalachia one day, and you know, so inspired by the sound of the wind in the wheat fields that I, you know, expected that." But this is the answer I got. He said, "Well, you know, I was in my apartment in Brooklyn, and my phone rang, and Martha Graham was on the phone, and she said, Aaron, I need twenty minutes of dance music for a piece I'm doing." and I need it by next Thursday. If you can have it for me by next Thursday, I'll pay you 200 bucks. And he said, I needed the money. So I said, Martha, you got it. You'll have 20 minutes of dance music by next Thursday. So he wrote this piece of music, 20 minutes of dance music. He didn't even name it. He didn't even name it Appalachian Spring or anything else. He just handed it over to Martha Graham who performed it at whatever thing she was performing at, uh, Martha Graham, famous American um, modern dance choreographer. And she named it. She named it Appalachian Spring. <laughs> it was not the answer I was looking for, but it was, it was enlightening, particularly because I'd asked him what was his inspiration for Appalachian Spring. And he looked at me and he said, there is nothing as inspirational as a deadline. And that really stuck with me. Obviously, this is, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, whatever. Long time, it has stuck with me. Nothing is inspirational as a deadline. What is a deadline? It's an artificial construct. Thursday, next Thursday, what does that mean? You know, but we make it real. We create it as a reality and we accept it as a reality. So it is our reality. And it's inspirational. It's inspirational. Right? You got to get it done. It has to be there by then. So you make it happen. Right? We need to do that. It's great to be on schedules. You know, I remember 
speaking of inspiration, I'm going to tell you, in a sense, two stories wrapped into one here. But um, a few years ago, my wife and I were, were visiting Oslo, Norway for the first time. She was there for a teaching artists conference. And since we've done a lot of traveling, but usually separately, we decided, you know, hey, let's do one together. So I tagged along with her to Oslo, Norway. It's really fortuitous that I did. I met a lot of good NLPers there nearby in Lillestrøm, um, Norway. As I went to Sweden and gave a talk in Gothenburg, Sweden, and also in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, where I met this wonderful fellow named Ulf Sandström. So lots of great things happened for this trip. But I digress. When my wife and I were there, we visited, as part of our, our visit of the city of Oslo, the Henrik Ibsen Museum. Now, Henrik Ibsen, if you don't know, is a playwright who uh, is the second most produced playwright in the world in history, um, second only to Shakespeare. After that, you know, Ibsen's many plays like uh, Hedda Gabler and I think Three Women and various other things are, are produced, arguably a lot in Norway, but still a lot everywhere. Second most produced playwright ever. And the museum that's there is basically his apartment. It's where he lived in Oslo for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years of his life. And so we went there. It's a fascinating place to visit. Saw how he lived, saw where he lived, you know, et cetera. And what was interesting about the inspiration part of it is that in his work study, there were two things that stood out. There was a large grandfather clock, still keeping time. And there was a large portrait of August Strindberg. Now, again, if you don't know, August Strindberg is a playwright also. He was a Swedish playwright, contemporary of, Strind of uh, Ibsen's. And interestingly, they considered themselves to be mortal enemies. Mortal enemies. They hated each other. Hated each other. These, if, if they were alive today, you know, they would be like, you know, just ripping each other apart on, on Twitter all the time. You know, they'd just be doing the scathing things. They didn't have that back then. But what they had were newspapers. And they would write these reviews of each other's plays and stuff. They said, this is the worst piece of theater I have ever seen. And, you know, just rip them apart, each other apart. So why would August Strindberg's portrait be hanging in Henrik Ibsen's uh, writing room? Give you three guesses. No, no, not that one. Uh, no, close. Right, that's it. It was for... <laughs> Inspiration, you got it. Inspiration, it's for inspiration. He was inspired not to measure up to this guy that he hated so much, but to show him, I'll show you, Strindberg, I'll write a better play than you. And it worked for him. It got him going, it got him inspired to write. But what was interesting also about his process of writing was that with it's, the docent in the museum said quite clearly with his wife's help, he got into that office every day by nine o'clock and started writing. And he would sit at that desk inspired by his desire to better his rival or whatever was inspiring that particular day. But at 1130, that grandfather clock would bong, it's 1130. He would put the pen down wherever he is, middle of a sentence, Middle of a word, maybe. I'm not sure of middle of a word, but certainly middle of a sentence. He put the pen down and he'd get up from his writing desk and he'd walk downtown, walk to the Grand Hotel there in downtown Oslo and have lunch. There was a special table set up for him. He did it every day. If you go there now, he has these um, brass, bronze footsteps all the way from the museum to the Grand Hotel downtown. So you walked it every day. People would line up and watch this, you know, national treasure of a man walk to his lunchtime, get his autographs maybe, I don't know. But um, always sat at that same table every day to watch people, to see how they interacted, to get inspiration, to get, you know, characters or whatever for his, his place. But the reason he said he put his pen down at 1130 is because when he came back from lunch, he would know exactly where to pick up. 
right? That if you finish the chapter, if you finish the line, if you finish the, the act in the, in the play, um, you'd be like, okay, now what? And you'd have to figure out how to take it from there. But if you left it off in the middle of a sentence, you'd know exactly where to leave it off to, to pick it back up again. Very interesting kind of um, process, right? And getting back to deadlines for a moment, it's really useful for the rest of us who perhaps are not quite as structured and um, disciplined uh, as Andrew Gibson to have that sense of deadline that I, not, I must have this by a certain time. Now, you might not have a deadline like Martha Graham says, I need that piece of music by Thursday and you'll get 200 bucks, which by the way, was a lot of money back in whatever, 1960. Um, but we can create our own deadlines. And the thing I wanted to talk to you about this little kitchen timer here, my friend, dun, 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 I'm gonna have to speak again. Oh, there you go, such a familiar sound. Um, is this can act as a deadline? An artificial one, obviously they're all artificial, right? Time is a construct, but this is totally artificial. Right? You, you set a timer, you say, I'm going to work for the next 20 minutes. And you set the timer for 20 minutes. There's something about having that sucker ticking down that makes you, makes me at least, speaking for myself, get into action. I start focusing, I start thinking, it's like, mm, I've got to work. Right? It's, it's crazy, but it's true. It's crazy and it's true. Let's put it that way. I would like to tell you that I, I learned this for myself a long time ago. I was um, a piano student, relatively okay, but there were things about my playing that definitely were only okay and needed to be improved if I wanted to you know, get good, to be a concert pianist or whatever my dreams were at the time. And I had a very fine piano teacher at college who, uh, who said I, I needed to get better at my playing of scales. I needed to play scales every day and a lot and a good and uh, C major, C minor, all the different um, intervals that you need to practice in, in quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets, 16th notes uh, uh, in opposite directions from each other. Was, there were lots of permutations of ways I was supposed to play scales. And I'm going like, well, why do I want to do this? This is no fun. So I want I want to play some Beethoven. I want to play some Bach. I want to play some Chopin. I don't want to play scales. How boring is this? But she insisted that, you know, every great pianist, including herself, and she was a great pianist, Claudette Sorel, um, did this and that you must do this. And, and if I would put in the work, I'd find out why, you know, how much better it makes you. So I finally said, okay, I'm going to figure out a, a way to do this. And, and I borrowed from my mother. I, I'm pretty sure I asked permission. I might have stolen it, but I'm pretty sure I asked permission to borrow my mother's kitchen timer. Hers was egg-shaped. Maybe you've seen them. They have like little eggs, and the, half of it has a winding, winding thing, and you set it to whatever time. So I, I, I borrowed that, and I went into the, the practice room, there at uh, Fredonia State University, where I went to college, and and um, closed the door and said, "Okay, for the next uh, half an hour, I'm gonna I'm gonna play scales the way my teacher wants me to." So I sat down and it set the timer and started going. Then I started playing my scales, and after about you know three four minutes, I checked and said, "Is it done yet?" <laughs> I was I was not done. I had like 17 minutes left to go. So I said, okay, let's back to it, back to it. Three or four minutes later, am I done yet? So um, yeah, I began to learn what 20 minutes feels like. <laughs> and, you know, what was good about it, what was good about it ultimately is that I got better at it. And I got better at playing scales in different hand positions, you know, in thirds and sixths and 13th and in opposite directions from each other, you know, starting with the right hand up at the top and left hand at the bottom and coming down to the middle and back out again, you know, the contrary motion. Um, I learned how to do all that stuff and I did it in every key and major and minor to the point where 
I would, you know, do it for an hour at a time. I'd set the, the timer for an hour and I'd, I'd happily I'd breezing through these things. I, I got very like proud of my prowess on playing scales. I could be a damn good scale player. And even when I was in England, this was kind of cool, actually. Um, you, you, you don't open practice room doors. If somebody's in their practice room, you can usually hear them through there. And it's rude to open the door when they're practicing, disturb their concentration. But I, I was once in, uh, when I was at the Guildhall School of Music in London, um, I was in there practicing and somebody opened the door and stuck their head in just to see who it was who was playing scales like that. That's actually one of the highlights of my life right there. <laughs> it shows, shows you what a pitiful little life I've had. But yes, that was awesome that somebody actually broke protocol in England, by the way, where you just don't do that sort of thing. You don't break protocols. Yeah. But they, uh, they, they wanted to find out who was playing scales like that. So yeah. Timers, baby. Timers are your best friend. And by the way, there is something I think unique about having a particular device dedicated to the job. Obviously, everyone probably in the world listening to this podcast certainly has a, a timer on their phone, right? Everybody has a smartphone of some level of intelligence of some kind. Um, timers are built into these suckers for the most part, and they're also very, very useful. Thank you very much. They work. I use them sometimes. And I will say there's something also really special about having a device that's dedicated to the job it's there for. So having a timer reminds you to use it, right? I've got three kitchen timers. One is in my kitchen, one is over by my piano, and one is right here next to me. And uh, I used to have one at my office in New York City while I had an office in New York City. And um, I still have that timer. It's in a, it's in a box at the moment, but um, it's in the wings. It's waiting in the wings for its, if, it's, if it's needed, it'll be there. And uh, yeah. Amazingly, amazingly useful. And by the way, also amazingly useful the how it works with the concept of a deadline. I've mentioned it before, but I'm going to tell you yet another story from my music background. I used to teach as a professional, quote unquote, musician. So I don't know if you can see me doing the air quotes as a professional musician. It doesn't mean I was you know, touring with David Bowie or anything like that. I was a piano player, yeah, and I played in clubs and played in bands, and that's all true. Most of the money I made was from teaching, teaching piano. I taught at the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music. I taught private lessons in my apartment. And when I was, you know, a young guy in my 20s playing in rock bands and also teaching piano lessons, the schedules didn't always um, combine real easily. So I'd be up really late and then have to, you know, do work in the daytime. And then I'd have kids coming to my apartment for piano lessons and like, oh gosh, I better clean up. <laughs> you know, I was not a slob, but you know, I was a 20 something, you know, single guy in New York City. So it wasn't always, you know, real, real clean either. And um, there were times it'd be like, oh, jeepers. Those are my exact words. Oh, jeepers. It's a uh, 315 or 320 or 325, you know, and I've got kids coming here in five minutes. I better get this done. So I would go into high gear. You've probably experienced something like this before. Go into high gear and just clean that apartment. You know, and then, you know, five minutes later, knock on the door or whatever. Oh, come on in. Oh, yes, have a seat, you know, and, and, and you know, it would pass muster. It might not have been if they'd looked in the closet or something, but, you know, where things were hidden. But it was good. And I realized, wow, look how much you can get done when you have to. Look how much you can get done when you have to. There's an old expression. I learned this a long time. I mean, I was a kid when my brother first told it to me, um, that work expands to fill time. Work expands to fill time. So if you have an hour to do something, it'll take you an hour. If you have to five minutes to do it, you get it done in five minutes. Obviously, there are exceptions to that. And there's a lot of truth to that as well, isn't there? So having a timer, like the one I won't 
uh, perform it for you again <laughs> with a little timer. Okay, I will. I'm going to perform for my next number. It is three seconds. That's it. Okay, so um, when you say to yourself, you're going to you're gonna get something done in 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour or 10 minutes or whatever it is, you tend to get better results than if you just said, I'll get it done whenever. This timer sucker is awesome. It is the essential coaching skill that I'm leaving you with today. If you can use this wisely, you can get a lot done. You can have that sense of deadline that Aaron Copeland talked about. You have that sense of inspiration that uh, Henrik Ibsen experienced. You can you know, get it done in five minutes if you have to, or a lot done in five minutes, a lot done in 10 minutes with the timer going. It's really kind of cool. You know, sometimes even today, um, I will, I'll put on the kitchen timer if I'm going to do dishes. I, I'm not a great fan of dish doing. My wife will tell you that. <laughs> she tell me sometimes says, Doug, you're good at a lot of things. Just step away from the sink. Uh, and, 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 and I'm willing to step away. But, you know, I, I will sometimes, in fact, do dishes. And uh, what I often do is I'll set the timer and say, okay, go. 10 minutes, see how much you can get done. Maybe that's not the best strategy for really good dishwashing now that I mention it, but <laughs> it's, it's mine. So anyway, that's my uh, story for you today. Stories, set of stories. And so I will leave you with that. Thank you for tuning in and get yourself a timer. It will be your new best friend. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks.